Hey, welcome to the Omen Revelations podcast, where we talk about geek stuff, we talk about television, we talk about comics, we talk about films, we talk about geek holidays. One thing we like to talk about is writing comics and making comics, and all of the things we've learned along the way as creators of the Omen Verse and Revelation comics. Tomorrow will be November 10th, and that just happens to be the birthday of Omen Comics titular character Frank Wade, a.k.a. Omen. I chose that particular day to be his birthday because it is also the birthday of the Marine Corps. And Frank was not only a Marine, he comes from a long line of Marines. And serving in the Corps is the thing Frank Wade is the most proud of. Uh, it's, it's the thing that uh, made his family who it was. He feels like it makes him who it was, who, who he is. And uh, so without further ado, let's get into our discussion on Omen mm -hmm. and how a, how a universe was built around him. Now, um, uh, I've been, I, I started working on characters uh, that ended up in Omenverse back when I was 12. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of these characters... Uh, uh, had been around for a little while, and I'd just been kind of adding to them throughout the years. But uh, in a particular, in about a, a, a three or four year stretch, there, I I started working on all the different characters and stories that would eventually mor morph into the Omenverse, uh, and uh, getting all that going and stuff in my head and on paper and all that. I, I was desperate to get into writing comics. Um, the biggest hurdle for me was that uh, other than the novel I wrote called the McFear Family Chronicles, uh, I had very little writing experience. Uh, I wasn't going to let that stop me, however, and I wanted to put my name out there for uh, as a writer for hire, and I just kept working on my characters and stories. Uh, characters like Malak Dumas and Michael Nero, the White Druid. Uh, the Court of the Black Hood and the Gallows Man and other stories that would become the blueprint for Omen Comics. Eventually, I got picked up uh, by a ground floor indie label called Bad Company Comics. And I only mention them now because I don't think they even exist anymore. Um, but to create a character, they wanted me to create a character called Omen and to build a universe around him. Um, now... <laughs> that that was that sounded like the perfect job for me uh, because I already had a universe of characters and stories and stuff. Uh, I could easily uh, add this into there. Uh, but uh, the idea would be that we would make the comic and put it on Kickstarter and everyone would get paid out of that. Uh, I was green as hell. And so I agreed to those terms and we agreed on a page rate. Um, let me tell you right now that if you get a deal like this, don't do it. Uh, there is no guarantee that you'll get paid since the Kickstarters rarely work, uh, nor is it even assured that the comics themselves will get made. Uh, I, I was a sucker because I wanted to get some experience in my name out there. Uh, don't make the same mistake. Uh, while I walked, ended up walking with the rights to my characters and uh, I had created and the, and the script, three scripts I had written for them, uh, Bad Company Comics had no intention of seriously putting a comic together and ultimately didn't pay anybody that worked for them. However, I did make some spiteful lemonade out of that by making something out of the Omen character and, and, and even naming my label after the character that they could have had, uh, Omen Comics, as you see behind me here. I, I will add that uh, anytime you would see a company called Bad Company Run, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I will say that you probably got out at lucky under the circumstances. Um, at least you were able to walk away with the rights uh, to your creations. And, you know, you were able to make them work on your own. And not a lot of people are, are, are necessarily able to do that. Um, because I think the biggest nightmare any aspiring creator has is to end up in a Jack Kirby uh, or Bill Finger or Steve Gerber situation where you just create everything. Uh, you, you reap none of the rewards at all. And then you watch other people handle what you create and you have no say in it. Uh, so I would say you probably dodged a bullet there. Um, with Kickstarters, I, I, I'm a little, take a little bit of a different view. Um, I think that they can work for some people, but I think the really successful ones are the ones that already have like a large enough following already, um, usually because they worked in mainstream comics or they have a YouTube audience and, and they have a following that's already built in that they can bring to it. But um, I, I will say it doesn't work for any of your body, especially if you're starting out. Um, it didn't really work for us, but I mean, fortunately, we had other options, and it worked out uh, in the end. 
Uh, it did work out for us, but you know, those other options had to be sought out. Uh, there have been three times since I started Omen Comics that I hit a dead end. And I mean, like a dead end, like, bam, I have no idea how I'm going to keep making comics or what's going to happen from here on out. Um, I, I won't go into all of that, but uh, I just want the listeners out there that might be just starting out like we were uh, to know that the, the success, uh, that success is not a straight path. And if you're going to make it, you have to be able to improvise. Mm -hmm. uh, dead ends don't mean the end of that journey, just the end of that particular path. Yeah. Um, but anyway, back to creating Omen. Um, back when I thought uh, my job, <laughs> my writing job for Bad Company Comics was a legitimate gig, um, I listened to the publisher's idea for the for the Omen character, and um, the publisher's idea, publisher's idea was an outright ripoff of Spawn. I mean, it was ridiculous. The scenes he wanted to do were straight out of the Spawn comic, which I recognized right away because I happened to be reading Spawn at the time. Uh, but it was like he'd never heard of copyrights and, and wasn't even trying to hide his plagiarism. Uh, I, I outright refused to do the character the way he wanted it to be done. But I told him I could rework it uh, so that what he wanted so that what he wanted to do could be there at least in spirit. And maybe we could do some emulating rather than imitating. And he agreed to that. Yeah, just while you did that, uh, I'm not sure that this guy knew how litigious Todd McFarlane's could be. Uh, so he probably dodged a bullet there too. Um, I will say that when you first pitched the Omens character to me, I, I could definitely see the spawn influence. Um, there were definite differences about it after you got through with it though. And I can tell you we're doing something uh, big and ambitious and complex, uh, even if you started with recognizable ideas. It's true. Um, I wanted to go in a whole new direction. Uh, so I skewed almost everything about Omen to be the opposite of Spawn. Uh, but I did keep two things from Spawn that I wanted for Omen. And that was the war between heaven and hell and Al Simmons' military background condemning him to hell. Um, I figured that if hell was recruiting, you know, why not heaven? Uh, for, for this war. Um, I wanted Omen to be given a second chance from heaven, uh, a chance to re redeem himself from the depths of his, uh, the sins he had committed in the name of duty. Uh, he would be given this chance because at the moment of his death, he sacrificed himself to save the lives of his men. And, and Jesus said in John 15, 13, that greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay his life down for his friends. And so for his act of great love, Omen would be offered a second shot at heaven if he wore the Omen armor and fought the armies of hell. Uh, I developed a black ops division for heaven called Shakur, which is a phonetic spelling of the Hebrew word for black. Uh, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't going too original there. I mean, it was, uh, it's a black ops unit. I named it black, uh, you know, <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, uh, anyway, I, I, I got this, uh, this uh, Shakur group together uh, to handle the arrangements, and I made up uh, an angel to broker the deal, uh, General Razel. Um, as the director of Shakur, I imagined the angel uh, Gabriel in that position, uh, bitter about being relegated to sitting behind a desk. Uh, I worked it so that if uh, Shakur as represented by General Rozelle, was going to offer Frank a shot at redemption as part of their recruitment, then redemption would be the overall theme of Omen's story and ultimately uh, be the theme of many of the Omen versus characters. Uh, without getting into spoilers, I can tell you that everything about Omen uh, has to do with his conversion and his redemption. Uh, even if the, even the Omen, Omen armor itself uh, is, is seeking redemption, uh, for Omen's name, uh, I was inspired by Deadpool uh, being named w Wade Wilson as a play on Deathstroke's name, Slade Wilson. And I decided to amalgamate uh, a name from Frank Castle and Wade Wilson and came up with the name Frank Wade. Yeah, I, I would say that the character came out really well. Um, I, I think he starts in familiar territory and then takes a sharp turn into something else. Um, the redemption theme is one that I really love myself and I use a lot myself. Uh, if you look at my own stuff, uh, you can definitely see that. And um, and I think that uh, redemption theme uh, probably made it easier to work within the Omenverse, at least for me. 
I'm I'm sure that my next move in creating the own verse helped out a lot too with our mutual background in mythology. Um, with heaven and hell at the center, I amalgamated the world's various mythologies into a single working narrative and incorporated all the characters I already had. I rewrote Omen under this paradigm and the Omen verse was born. Uh, thus named because Omen was at the center of the universe. Um, it was around this time that I formed the Omen crew out of the creators I had come to know along the way. Um, I know I, can, I can't have two right hands, but uh, for me, uh, writer Steve Sellers and artist uh, Tosin Awasika quickly became that for me. So Steve, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it's like working within the confines of the Omenverse? Yeah, I would say there was a learning curve for me. Um, it was a challenge coming into the Omenverse at first, <laughs> mainly because there was so much of it to figure out and understand. Um, and, 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 and there was a definitely a steep learning curve as I try to make sense of what your larger plan was and who all these characters were you know, and all these things. Um, there were these deep world building notes you would send me that I would try to unpack because there's just so much to this universe and its mythology. Um, but eventually I did figure it out and, and I'm more able to draw on more of the mythos as I need to by now, but uh, it was definitely daunting early on. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, as I said, I, I had been working on all this for quite a while and well, I, I take a lot of notes when building a world. Uh, I learned how to build worlds by reading Tolkien and how he developed Arda. Uh, that, is, that is evidence, I think, by the 50 files I sent you in the notes and stories. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but on the plus side, it did give you a good sense of the world, no? Oh, oh, definitely. And Tolkien's definitely a great model to draw on for these kinds of things. I mean, Middle Earth is vast in terms of his lore, and and much of that is really because Tolkien spends so much time uh, doing detailed world notes, um, as we've seen in a lot of the supplemental books that his late son Christopher was involved in. And after years of work, I mean, everything starts adding up, and that's just the nature of the beast. It, it happens, and you just have to figure it out and work with that. Um, I think, though, that one of the strengths of the Omenverse as a setting is the idea that any mythology is fair game. So at the beginning, I had to dig into uh, Celtic myth, which was at the time was something I hadn't been all that familiar with. Um, and then I did a White Druid and Michael Nero, and I had to learn it really fast. So I knew some of the basics, and I'd seen adaptations of it elsewhere, but I had to get a deeper idea of Blue as a character especially. And then I would discover things while I researched Celtic mythology that worked its way to that series. Um, so Lou's son was a legendary Irish hero, Fu Cullen, uh, who, which I couldn't ignore, and that became uh, Cullen O'Shea. And then I thought about uh, their mutual Fomorian heritage and try to make sense of how that influences Lou and Cullen as characters, which I, I think turned out all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty proud of my Irish heritage, and you can definitely see its dominant influence in the myths I was working on uh, with, with the creation of several of my characters in the Omen verse itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's totally understandable. And I think we all have stories that we want to tell about who we are and where we come from. Um, I haven't really had the opportunity to delve deeply into those kinds of stories yet personally, but that edge is always there as a writer. So, but, you know, eventually. Um, I, I also had to figure out your other characters pretty quickly. Um, I latched on to Sarah Baton uh, early on because she's just the kind of villainess that I click with and had things to add to her and I had things to say. Um, when you said she was Brazilian, I felt like that opened up doors for me because I was able to deepen her background a bit, and that informed who she is for me. Um, Patrick O'Leary, um, who we're going to see in uh, White Drew and Michael Nero 3, uh, was a bit more challenging as he's not my typical kind of character. Um, I, I'm not really so much into the serial killer types, but I think that sometimes that, that kind of challenge opens doors. Um, but it's these kind of characters I can work in occasionally that gives a feel of the shared universe um, that you're aiming for uh, with the Omenverse. Um, but despite the fact that I haven't used any established Omenverse characters there yet, I would say the one series that draws the most from Omenverse mythos is the Guardians of a Lamb. Um, that book takes really, I think, the most from your big picture ideas and especially from your ideas in Omen. Uh, the Shakur are a big part of that book, for example. Uh, the War with Heaven and Hell is important to what's going on in Guardians as well, uh, for similar reasons as, as Omen is. Um, you have the Elaeum tree itself, the framework of time and space in the Omenverse, and that's a big picture to the big uh, key element to that big picture. Um, the beauty of Guardians of Lamb, though, I, I think, um, is that it draws on all the all mythologies or true angles. So what sets that book apart um, 
as a time travel series is we can drop the Guardians into all those existing mythologies in addition to our own and what you've put together. So, you know, we, yeah, we started the crucifixion, we moved to the Trojan War, and then we moved to other points in myth or literary-based history. Um, and there are also connections to White Druid that we'll see down the road. Um, I think we probably will see Lou at some point. Uh, so, so Guardians will eventually will feel more like a part of the larger Roman verse as that develops. Um, and then one other story I look forward to doing with Guardians involves a, a major background character in the Omen series that I remember you set up early on. Um, and this was a case where we both had similar ideas about who this character was. And then you pitched to me that you wanted to do a Guardian story with him. Um, and and uh, to me, that was great because I already knew what that story would take place. I knew when it would take place and what the historical event around that would be. So it fit completely perfectly. And, and I think that that story is going to be one of the toughest battles that the Guardians have ever been in if we play our cards right. But all in all, I think we've like. I think we've learned to make our approach work for us. Um, the way I play in the Omenverse sandbox now is just to make what I do feel self-contained while using Omenverse elements to create the sense of the larger universe. So I look for holes in the Omenverse to fill with new things that work with what I do based on the rules you've already set up. So for me, it's important to stay consistent with those rules. And within that, we can do pretty much anything. And the premise gives us both plenty of room uh, to operate, really. Well, uh, that that pretty much covers uh, our, our discussion on on Omen and uh, building the the Omen verse. Uh, I want to thank you guys for uh, hanging out with us and and listening and uh, celebrating Frank Wade's birthday. Uh, so live long and prosper, folks. This has been the Omen Revelations podcast. Uh, this has been Steve Sellers and Michael Nunley uh, with Omen Comics and Revelation Comics where we offer a wide variety of independent comics in all kinds of different genres, ranging from fantasy to superhero war comics, uh, and the Omenverse, uh, which is our major home. Uh, so please, uh, if you want to support us, you can find our books on Amazon, uh, Global Comics, and Comixology, and wherever comics are sold. Um, I hope you'll continue to support us, and until next time, we'll see you in the Omenverse.